Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Today we have a returning guest, Jonathan Stokey, back. Welcome, Jonathan. It's great to be here. So uh, I wanted to have you back on because I, I watched your uh, YouTube kind of coaching session with Peter Freeman uh, from Crunch Time Coaching. He's actually having Tennis Con 8 um, here coming up shortly. And you went over the Stokey six and y'all were more focused, I think, in that conversation on singles. And these are basically six errors that if club level players that they can avoid, um, they can dramatically improve their game. And I wanted to have you on to to do this for doubles. Um, so talk a little bit about, I, I guess, to start where the Stokey six came from and, and kind of the story behind it. Yeah, so... I think it just starts with my overall philosophy. And again, these are just things that I experienced as a player myself when I was a junior and when I was an All-American at Duke. And then I have experiences as a coach watching my players, even more so I'm more of aware of these things. So the number one basic philosophy is that points are lost, not won. Mm -hmm. Yes, occasionally you will see a club level player just hit a great shot and win a point. I understand that that happens. But the majority of points I watch and I experience as a player are generally speaking lost. And mm -hmm. so the bigger piece of the pie, if you're looking to get better and improve, I'm always going, can I just get this guy to stop losing so much like that? It sounds yeah. so negative, but like I'm watching you and you're just losing points over and over and they end up happening in a very, very similar way. So I get a little bit of pushback online where people are like, no, you don't understand. If you saw my four or five <laughs> league, like points are one all the time. Maybe that's the case. Like I haven't no, seen four nope, or five. It's play. not. It's I, not. I, I highly <laughs> doubt it. I don't want to sound preachy, but all I can say is just in my experience as a coach and a player, that is a fundamental principle that once you accept that, you can actually make a very quick leap. Points yeah. are usually lost, not won. And so we've got to learn how to reduce them. So that's kind of like, where it came from. And I started going, well, the other part too, actually, sorry, is um, Scott Fawcett was on my podcast. So he's a golf, he's a very famous golf uh, tactician. It's all about math. And he has five stats called the tiger five. And mm -hmm. so golf is very similar. It's not about making birdies. It's about reducing double bogeys and bogeys. It's a very mm -hmm. similar concept. And so he actually asked me on the podcast, well, what would the tennis equivalent be? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's a really good question. I can't yeah. answer that right now, but I'm gonna go think about it. So those two concepts combined is kind of where I came up with the Stokey six. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something I'm, I'm always kind of telling my listeners uh, that I learned from uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy. He, he did this, I think it was in one of his courses on his website, brain game tennis. It may have even been a blog post that he did um, was he, he took, and this was in singles, but he took uh, all of like the biggest stats um that are tracked on the pro tour, right? So you've got winners, errors, uh, first serve percentage, first serve win percentage, second serve win percentage, double faults. Um, uh, th there was probably 18 or 20 of them. And he correlated each one with winning. So it's like, you know, if you win this particular stat, what are the odds you win the match? And the one that correlated the most with winning was having fewer errors and it was way your odds of winning having fewer errors are way higher than your odds of winning having more winners um and honestly i've got the data i should do this for doubles um at the pro level and then i, I work with a company called tennis analytics who uh gets data for pro matches as well as like club level matches at times and when you when you look at the stats across you know whether it's four or five tennis like you're talking about or pro tennis uh, the stats change a little, but not that much. Like they, you know, and I hear this from listeners or people on email all the time too. It's like, oh, but that's pros. Like they're playing a totally different game. And it's like, no, they're not. Um, the winner to error ratio, for example, um, Tennis Analytics has a, a good chart on this. And it's like, I think pros hit three or four winners for every one error. And 3-0 players hit... I think three winners for every one error. I think pros it's four to one and club level it's three to one or maybe the opposite. I don't remember, but it's like, it's the same trend, right? It's like the same idea. 
Right. And I actually, I did an Instagram reel. This was probably a couple of months ago now. And just going back to the whole idea of errors. I think people, if I want everyone out listening to like do a deep dive and actually think about this maybe for a couple of minutes after, but I think people are more afraid of what their opponent can do to them. And they're less afraid of actually missing. Mm -hmm. So they miss a lot of balls that if their whole objective was just to make it, they could, but they went for an aggressive shot and then end up missing because they either were worried that if they just put it in play, their opponent would hit a winner, which won't happen that often. Mm -hmm. Or they go, well, I have to make my opponent miss. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no, bro, they're going to miss for free. <laughs> like, yeah. you just got to give them a chance. Like, yes, there is there is a place in the game for forcing errors. I'm not dismissing that. Yeah. But they feel this pressure to always be doing it, and it just leads to them missing more. And so if you go, you know what? If I made my last shot in the point, I played a solid point. Mm -hmm. you'll be surprised number one how relaxed you feel but you actually won't hit less winners like mm -hmm. you'll still end up just accidentally hitting the same amount it's just you're going to miss a little bit less and now that four six set will become a six four set because you just got rid of four stupid mistakes mm -hmm. yeah i i think um so i would encourage people listening if you're questioning some of this you should actually go and watch your teammates play a league match or a tournament match or something grab a pen and paper and go sit on the sidelines and actually chart this. And after, at the end of each point, write down W for winner and E for error. And at the end of the match, you can look at the number of errors. And you can even divide it up by like point one. So you can create two columns and you can do team A on the left side, team B on the right side. And then if team A won the, uh, the point, then you do uh, either a W or an E under the team A column. And then in the next line, you do a W or E under the team B column if they won that point. Uh, and it's an easy way to chart the match and really it'll kind of blow your mind the first time you do it. Cause I've done this myself before with, uh, with actually some five O matches. And it was when I was first getting into all this data and yeah, I remember at the end of the match adding it all up and I was like, man, there were like six errors in this entire, I mean, six winners in this entire match. And like, 30 errors like it's unbelievable um well i, I think so you I, could also you could also do it for the pros too i mean uh, a lot of the people i work with remotely mm -hmm. you know i'll say hey did you watch that you know did you watch pagula who was it against oh anna samova in the finals and everyone knows yeah. i'm the best pagula fan out there and yeah she was up she won the first set and she was up maybe maybe it was one zero forty love but she had won 15 to 16 points mm -hmm. and then she just made like on the next six points, like five of just the worst errors. And mm -hmm. I was like pulling my hair out. I'm like, oh, just be solid, you know? And she won the tournament. She's one of the best players in the world. And even she will give away a ton of what she would probably call free points. And, right. and Samova is also in the finals and she was doing the same thing right back. Like I, there's just this myth that people are just always playing this amazing tennis and it's constant and errors and poor points are the outlier. And it's the exact opposite. And once mm -hmm. you embrace that, tennis gets a lot easier to get better at. Yeah, it gets a lot easier to win for sure. Um, you're somebody I feel like every time we talk, we could go on for like two or three hours because you love the the stats and strategy and tactics as much as I do. Um, let's dive into uh, the Stokey Six. So what is uh, number one? So number one is missed returns. The, the first three are in the first four shots. But the most mm -hmm. common one is going to be a missed return, right? So why and, why the first four shots? Uh, just because we know that points are short. So majority of points are four shots or less. And then right. obviously we know from Craig's data that, you know, the most common point in tennis is are the rally length is one, which means a mm -hmm. serve was made and then a return was missed. Like that happens the most. And so you go, if I can just make more returns, once, I, once I'm in the point, you're probably winning 40, 45% at worst, even if you think mm -hmm. your return is not that great. So instead of worrying so much of, oh, I got to hit this amazing cross court by my opponent, or I've got to hit this sick down the line, just make the return. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are going to be times where the opponent hits a serve that's really quality. It's not your fault. That's fine. That's part of the game. But we're talking about some maybe some easy second serve return errors or... Mm -hmm. You're missing a return wide. I mean, before we right before we started it, the doubles court is 36 feet wide. Like, yeah. why why are we missing a return wide? Because we're scared of the opponent net player who probably is just like you and isn't fully comfortable at the net and doesn't finish every volley. So yeah. that's just one I see 
a lot is we've got this huge court. A lot of times the serve is not incredible and we're just donating one or one and a half points per service game to our opponent because we've just not put the return in play. Mm -hmm. And so I, part of what goes with that is getting a little more comfortable with maybe occasionally you're going to make a return. That's not that quality and they will hit a volley winner and you right. clap and you clap your racket and you just play the next point and you move you on. You don't yeah. start going, you know what I should do is maybe just add a bunch of risks to my return. And now <laughs> instead of them hitting one or two volley winners, I'm just going to give them three free return errors. Yeah. That's and, not, and really, that's, go ahead. Yeah. And, and really like what, uh, one thing I tell people is like, you're waiting, even if they're like making a quality first serve, you're hitting a return in, they're hitting a volley winner. They're just doing their job. Right. And what you're doing especially against teams who are good at serving, right? Um, that means they have a good server and a good net player. Uh, and what you're doing is trying to make a high percentage of returns like you're talking about. And you're waiting for that one game where the server misses three or four first serves and the net player misses one or two of those volleys. And then that's your opportunity to break. Um, so you want to stay consistent, like you're saying, with those returns and something that we talked about last week on, on your podcast. Uh, so pe people listening, Jonathan hosts the uh, Baseline Intelligence podcast, which you should check out. I was on recently. Um, and we, we talked about the lob return. And I think uh, it was something I found in the data doing the Team USA scouting for the Olympics at the pro level, the highest level in the world. This is studying Tommy Paul and Taylor Fritz. Um, Tommy Paul's lob return off of first serve, his win percentage was better than his, uh, you know, driven return off of a first serve. So at the club level, I would imagine that might even be more effective because our overheads are so much worse. Um, and the lob is pretty similar. Like maybe we won't get it quite as deep, but the net player is not going to be able to backpedal as quickly. And if they do, their overhead's going to be much worse. So I would encourage people to really add that lob return to their game, especially against first serves. And then the other mistake in doubles that I see is, is against weak second serves, people trying to just pummel the return and they make errors. Right. And there's, there's a place to be aggressive on a second serve return. I mean, if you hit sure. three thunderous returns and then you miss one on a second serve, I'd be like, that's probably a good ratio. Like that's fine. Sure. Like, you're going to be okay. It's when you're missing every other one. Right. Yeah. And when the ones that go in really aren't doing a whole lot, um, so yeah, you just want to keep it very, very simple. If you've made your last shot, I think it's good to adopt the mindset. You go, Hey, that's a really, really solid point. Oh, but mm -hmm. my return was short and weak. That's okay. Like, yeah. I know you didn't mean to, but if that's your mistake is hitting a weak ball in. And then when you hit your average or good shot, they're even better. Like that's a ton of pressure over time. If your bad shots are just free points that takes mm -hmm. a lot of pressure off the opponents and, and makes it a lot easier to lose a match. So Put the return in play. If you need to take a step back, great. If you need to lob exactly down the middle of the court, then do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, go watch a video. I actually just did this with a guy. It was more for singles, but he said, well, if I hit short, you know, the guy just steps up and crushes it. And I was like, oh, okay, let's just, let's just start from the first. Let's go back and look for that. And I just froze the video on swing vision every time the ball landed in the service box. Yeah. And like the guy wouldn't even step up and hit it. Like the guy hit like three winners and I'm like, do you see what I'm watching now? He's like, oh my God, I never, he's like, I just only remember the times that they crush it. Yeah. And I feel like that's how everyone sees it. Oh, see, he's just going to put an easy volley away. Yeah. Yes. Five times a match. The other 50 <laughs> times you're going to be just fine. So yeah. number one, make returns. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to uh, number two. So I put this down as miss plus ones and in double specifically, I am referring to a baseline shot. So I, my general philosophy, another general philosophy I have is that it's better to obviously make errors on offense. Like mm -hmm. you're going to make mistakes, at least make it when there is a reward in play. So if I'm way behind the baseline and I'm on defense and I miss the ball, like I am livid with myself. There's mm -hmm. not a whole lot of great things that could have happened. So make sure you just make the point. If you get a plus one as a volleyer in doubles, if you're being aggressive, that means sometimes you're going to miss a volley. Like, I'm mm -hmm. actually okay with that. So this is mainly for the server or the returner. When you've got that first ground stroke, it's the miss plus one. And again, it's the same idea as the return. It's I've got a 36-foot wide court. 
generally speaking, there's only one person at the net, which means I have a ton of room and they're usually not comfortable. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be insanely aggressive. We just need to be simple. We made our serve and we made the next ground stroke. We made our return and we made the next ground stroke. Incredible job by you, right? Mm -hmm. If any of those shots have great quality, wow, A plus and a racket clap. But you don't have to have that every time. And so, again, if you just go back and watch people play, it's a lot of off-balance shots. They might go down the line on the first ball trying to pass them. They might be worried about the person in the net and dump that first ball in the net. So, again, it sounds very, very simple. But, like, I think if you go back and watch your matches, and, again, if people aren't watching their matches on video, that's an issue. But I'll bet you most players have 10 or so first ball ground stroke errors in a mm -hmm. doubles match. And you're like, the goal is to get that to five. Yeah, like you're gonna, you can't just not miss. That's that's impossible. But let's just reduce those plus one errors. So with these plus ones in doubles, it's a little bit different, like you said. So we've got the net players. Um, I, I think if we're just talking about the server and the returner, a big component of it is going to be shot selection, right? So recognizing if my plus one is more of an offensive shot versus a defensive shot, um, talk a little bit uh, about that and how we can reduce our errors on the plus one, maybe for offensive shots and then defensive shots. Are you saying how, how you can reduce it like technically or like just the mindset? No, just like the mind sh mindset and, and shot selection. So I'm thinking like a lot of times I'll see a server hit a good first serve, a weak return comes over the net and they have a short forehand and they miss it. Um, mm -hmm. so that would be a scenario where like, it's an offensive shot, right? They have a short forehand, they're on offense They're um, to use a phrase, I don't remember where I heard this, but, uh, it, it might've been Craig O'Shaughnessy, um, where you're ahead in the point. So like during, like, if you freeze frame the point right there, you're ahead in the point, you should probably win that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they make an error on that serve plus one. So that would be offensive. Right. So like, again, for me, it's hopefully it doesn't sound like I'm contradicting myself. I don't mind the occasional error if it's on offense, because if you're hitting a ball mm -hmm. faster and you're trying to do something, it's a little riskier. Like mm -hmm. I actually had one parent one time say, I just want my daughter to hit faster, but also just be more consistent. And I was like, Oh, that's all <laughs> like, that's all you, <laughs> that's a great idea. Like I had never thought about that. So like, <laughs> if I'm asking you to step up on a short ball and play offensively, you will mm -hmm. randomly miss some balls. And by the way, that means sometimes you're going to miss in the net because you're hitting faster. You can't hit with pace and height right? Mm -hmm. Missing wide on a short plus one is probably not ideal because like I said, the court is huge and the net player is probably scared of you to begin with. So there's no reason to be going angle, but I'm okay with that occasional, you know, I'm three quarter court and shorter. Mm -hmm. You should absolutely step up and apply a little pressure. That's fine. Yeah. And it, again, you just have to keep this tally in your head. Are you missing every other one? Then you're being too aggressive. Mm -hmm. Are you missing one out of every five of those short balls? That's great. You're probably right where you should be. If the returner is constantly putting me behind the baseline or in an uncomfortable position, that's where I would say, I don't care if it's a lob. I don't care if you go through the middle and it's a high volley for your opponent. Let's just be solid mm -hmm. and accept that they have earned the right based on their return or whatever it was that they have put me in a bad position. I've done my job being solid. I've made them hit a volley winner and I can move on with my life. There's definitely a different mentality to those two plus ones and and as always the rules is always it depends like every situation is different these rules are generally speaking but that's a good kind of different mindset for the short ball versus the one from behind the baseline yeah yeah that makes sense i think those defensive shots practicing that defensive lob is so big um there's especially from the deuce court there's so many players who try to hit this running down the line forehand winner when they're like off balance and on defense and it's like and that is a one out of five shot. Like that is, if you want to win the match, that's not a good shot to be going for. Right. Um, all right. So let's move on to uh, the next one. I, I actually almost, you know what? I may end up removing this one in the future. Stay tuned. Number three okay. is double, double faults. Okay? okay. And the reason why I would remove it is because this is something people are so sensitive towards. You know, they finish a match. I had, oh, I had double faulted like six times. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, that means you played, I don't know, 80 other points. Like, do you, do you know how many of anything else you did? No, just double faults. That's the only thing you want to keep track of. So yeah. I don't want people to obsess about it too much. But again, just with being solid, let's make sure we're making our serve. 
you know, mm -hmm. oh, your second serve is slow and oh my God, they've been ripping it. Okay, make them rip it. And guess mm -hmm. what? If your second serve is so slow for whatever your level is, let's say I'm playing in a four or five league and my second serve is so weak and they're ripping it, then we'll just play two back. You know, yeah. and we'll be able to make that ball. Like we, we can we can figure something out, but we need to make them play. And sometimes people either go for too much on their first serve. And so they're just having to hit a lot of second serves. Sometimes they're so yeah. worried about the returner. But again, you're just donating free points. And so at Duke, you know, it used to be a pro set when I was there, but I'd go back and check and I'd be like, okay, you missed eight returns. You double faulted four times. So that's 12 points that our opponents never had to play against you. Mm-hmm. They just had to make a serve or just stand in the box while you miss serves against them. That's a lot of points you're donating. Yeah. What if we, what if we cut it down to six? You know, we're, we're already going to get better without even learning how to hit a better poaching volley or whatever. So I know people are sensitive to that. And that's the only reason why I would get rid of that one. But again, it's just being solid in the first four shots. No, I think it's an important one, especially at the club level. I feel like it's less common at the pro level, but I, I mean, I to be honest, I I have analyzed some players who that double fault percentage creeps up to near like ten percent uh, at the pro level, and um, when it gets around that like seven eight percent mark, like it's something they've got to work on, you know. Um, so I, I think at every level, it's an important one. One thing I would encourage people to do, uh, and this is something I learned from from analyzing the pros, is uh, see if you can track and maybe get a teammate to do this with you or something. And you can do this on first and second serves, but see if you can track where you miss your faults because a lot of players, not everyone, but a lot of players have a very significant tendency to either miss in the net or miss long. Um, so there was somebody I was analyzing a few months ago uh, and I, I just looked at three matches and the player uh, had double faulted I think 20 times in three matches or something. And 17 of the 20 ser second serve misses were in the net. Um, so it was like insane, like 85% in the net. So it's like, okay, just make sure all your double faults are long. And if mm -hmm. you do that and just simply aim higher on all your second serves, you're going to end up with instead of 20 double faults, you know, 15 or 12 or something like that in those three matches. Um, so if you have one of those tendencies, it's really important to to know that. Yeah, one one side note I would make, and this is like a recent theme. I think every coach, you know, gets stuck on things and cycles of their career because tennis is a simple sport. And so if you just said the same thing for 40 years, you get bored. But <laughs> one thing that's been working for me is like just asking yourself the question, is what I'm doing working? So you're like in that example, this person is hitting serves in the net. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. You ask that person, is it physically possible for you to hit the next serve over the net? If I gave you a million dollars, could you do it? They'd probably be like, well, yeah, I can do that. Like, okay, you should look into that. Yeah. You, know, you, sh you should probably do that, right? Well, I don't know if it's going to go in. Well, how's hitting it in the net every time working for you? And yeah. by the way, now at least you've made the opposite error. So we have a feel for what might be correct. So people yeah. just get stuck in this loop and they're doing the same thing and they're attempting in their mind. They think they're trying to solve it, but in reality, the output is just the same. Hey, here's 17 mm -hmm. serves in the net. Just ask yourself, is that working? Can I do the opposite of that? The answer is usually yes, unless it's an emotional thing. And mm -hmm. so just let's just do it now instead of adding 10 more double faults in the net before we fix it. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. So step one is just recognizing where you're making the errors. So this player had no clue that 85% of their second serve faults were in the net. Um, so making them recognize that. And then next time you go practice, like set up targets two feet behind the surface line for those second serves and practice hitting those targets, you know, um, because a lot of people get caught up with like, oh, I keep missing in the net because it's like my elbow or I'm dropping my shoulder. And it's like, just aim higher. Like everything else will take care of itself. Just aim higher and it'll can fix it. Can I give you a stupid story? My last yeah. year uh, in, no, sorry. My first year, 18s and juniors, Rajiv and I were, we won Kalamazoo, but we were on our way to winning it. And I was starting to get a little nervous. And so each round at Kalamazoo, round of 16 quarter semis, my serve was just feeling like a little weirder each time. It just, mm. it was going in, just didn't feel quite right. And we won Kalamazoo. Okay, great. So we're in the US Open in two weeks. That's awesome. I'm excited, but I'm also like, what the hell is going on with my serve? We played grass courts the next week. And I played Ryler to Hart, who ended up being a great 
college player. I think he gets like top 200 in the world. I play him in the backdrop of this ITF and I double faulted probably 45 times in a three set match, which yeah. by the way, amazing job by me to make it three sets with 45 double faults. <laughs> yeah. But like, I was just lying to people. I was like, oh, I have a shoulder injury. Oh, like I, I just was making stuff up because it was so embarrassing. And I went home and I was at Vandermeer at the time. And Dennis Vandermeer was like, hey, um, can you hit a serve for me real quick and have it hit the baseline? I was like, okay. And like, I did that. He's like, that was awesome. He's like, now can you hit a serve and hit the bottom of the net, the bottom square? I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Boom. And he's like, okay, now can you just hit one on the service line, please? And I hit it right on the service line. I just looked at him. And I was like, this is stupid. Like, what, <laughs> what a stupid game, right? But like, he just made it athletic. I was kind of in my own head. He's like, you can hit deeper on command when you want. Like yeah. this is, is you're, you're in your own head with this thing and you can make these yeah. small adjustments. And that was like a very helpful, there was also a tossing issue for me, which we fix as well, but he was kind of like, you're making this bigger than it is. Yeah. Just go on the extremes. And so that really helped me, but I understand people getting stuck in the loop, but if you take a step back and just go, what's the issue, you can usually fix it. Yeah. I like that phrase to go on the extremes, like just do the extreme one direction, the extreme, the other direction, and then you can kind of narrow your your gap and kind of your feel on the serve or whatever the stroke is. Um, yeah, I, I do that a lot with actually angle volleys. When I coach people to hit angle volleys, I tell them like, I'd rather you miss it because we're practicing like those super sharp angles from really close to the net. And I'm like, I'd rather you miss it in the net or miss it wide than miss it past the cone that I have set up because I want you feeling the ball off the strings and feeling that super sharp angle and after you miss a bunch of them in practice, you won't need as big of an angle once you get to the match. Um, so that makes it a lot of, a lot easier. Uh, so let's move on to number four. Number four, and these things layer on top of themselves. So sure. what I'd love people to start doing is like actually keeping a tally. So I double faulted. Okay, that's one Stokey six air, right? I missed a return. That's one. But number four is any ground stroke wide. Mm. So again, the court is massive. It's 36 feet wide. There's one player on the other side of the net that probably isn't this advanced elite net player. Missing a ground stroke going wider than those people to me is a complete mental error. And I understand that there's a physical breakdown because obviously you did not aim wider than the court. So something physical happened, but if you had picked a bigger target, that poor stroke would have still found the court somewhere, mm -hmm. right? So going back to like, the plus one, if I missed a plus one wide, that's two Stokey six airs at the same time. That's a two pointer. That's, mm -hmm. ooh, that's brutal. I hate that. Not only did you miss the first ball, but you missed it wide. So number four is any type of ground stroke missed wide. And it kind of goes back to what I just said, but missing it on the first ball is twice as bad for me. It's like you did mm -hmm. two things at the same time. Um, I just don't understand the concept. And a lot of times my recommendation would be like, don't even worry about the net player. If you're missing wide because you're so con – we actually did a drill this morning where the ladies were in a very aggressive position, and then all of a sudden we started missing ground strokes wide. And I'm like, just for the record, I've only seen like two good volleys today. Like, where mm -hmm. positioning is awesome, but we still can't volley any better. Like, we don't yeah. need to be missing wide. So almost just delete that person from your mind, pick a big target, hit the quality ball, and if they end up poaching, good for them. It really doesn't happen that often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something I think you talked with Peter about is um, the, I guess, the margin of error on your shot. I think you had a different word for it. And you all talked about the pro players, how theirs is, is a lot smaller. And recently, I actually did a, a Instagram lesson yesterday, um, one of those short videos on Alcaraz at the Olympics. And uh, as of right now, it's being blocked by Instagram because of copyright issues or whatever, but um, I'll try to figure that out. But I think it's still up on Facebook. But Alcaraz hits this great inside end forehand winner from the ad court off of a lob from the opponent. So they were in a down the line rally. His opponent was in the ad court. He was in the deuce court. Uh, his opponent hits a backhand lob cross court and Alcaraz is fast enough to run all the way around and get a forehand. He hits this inside end winner down the line it lands barely outside of the singles line, like barely into the doubles alley. And it was one of the things I pointed out, like he's not aiming for the doubles alley, like he's aiming for the singles court here. And I think for the club level player, we should basically never aim for the doubles alley. Um, I think probably depending on your skill level, like if you're a 3-0 player, you should probably never aim for even within like 
two or three feet of the singles line, maybe even further. Um, and then as you get more advanced, you can get a little bit more aggressive with that. But uh, talk a little bit about, I guess, that margin of error and if correct anything, if I didn't explain it right. No, that's that's good. So this also, the idea comes from Scott Fawcett, Decade Golf, the guy that I have my podcast. And I had followed him for years. He calls it a shot pattern. Mm -hmm. So if I put a single tennis ball and I place it down on the court, let's say right in the middle of the ad court, depth and width wise, it's just right in the middle of that back box. And I feed Jesse Pagula backhands. I go, hey, hit that ball. Is mm -hmm. she going to hit that ball every time? No chance. Like yeah. she's going to hit exactly where that one ball is? No way. She might hit it once every 30 times. Maybe. I mean, it's a very, yeah. very small target. Maybe once every 30. But she'll be close to it because she's a pro. So she might miss it three feet left, then three feet right, then six feet short, then five feet long. Her pattern is probably... 18 feet long and seven feet wide on average. And of course mm -hmm. that can change when she's in trouble, it gets even bigger. But if you watch pros, you know, you watch Novak play a tiebreaker. He hits a lot of ground strokes on the service line. Do you really think he was aiming for the service line? Like there's no way mm -hmm. he hit that shorter than he thought. And whenever a pro misses, they obviously hit it lower, wider, or deeper than they wanted to. And so a amateur shot pattern is absolutely gigantic. Yeah. So one thing I have, like the lower level player, I'm like, hey, you should just aim middle of the court. And they always say, well, I don't want to hit middle. I'm like, don't worry. You're not going to hit it where you're aiming. <laughs> like, that's actually the last place I think it's going to go is middle. Yeah. And so you have to actually be honest with yourself. And so when I'm hitting a cross court ground stroke in doubles, you know, the doubles alley is four and a half feet wide. I would probably say like, for me, I'm aiming two feet inside the singles line. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a really good player. Oh, you're a three, five. Mm, I, I would even aim four feet inside the single sideline. So now you have yeah. a nine and a half foot margin for error, which you are going to use a lot. Yeah. And I think people, again, once you can accept you don't hit the ball where you aim, it gets very, very easy to pick these smart targets. Everyone always thinks like, oh, this feels good. Oh, I know I can hit this shot. And then they attempt it. And then they go, why'd I do that? Mm -hmm. And you just have to accept I have this pattern. I have this kind of oval. Where can I place that oval in the court? So most of my outcomes are positive outcomes for me. And that mm -hmm. is the whole idea. And that's why missing wide for me is like, I still have hair, thankfully. I have short hair, but like, I want to just rip it out when I see one of my players miss wide. Yeah. Just, just move it in with the target. <laughs> it reminds me of those players you see. Um, this is probably exclusively at the club level, but who have these, and it's usually a guy, they have these big first serves. They're, they're swinging really hard on these first serves and their first serve percentage is like 30%. And it's like, they get free points when it goes in, but they're like, Oh, but like my serve was just off today. And I'm like, dude, you're going too big. Like 100%. you probably have an over 50% first serve percentage once every five matches. Like this is not as your serves off today. Like you're just going for too much. Absolutely. Um, it kind of reminds me of that a little bit. But one question I have for you with this oval is why do you think the depth is larger than the width? It's a really good question. I think because, especially as you get better, tennis is a lifting game. So you're swinging more low to high than you are like across the ball. Mm -hmm. So if you saw someone and they swung straight horizontally, well, then if you don't time that perfectly, it could be a really, really wide dispersion. But if you're mm -hmm. watching Pagula hit a backhand as she's approaching the ball, it's really more low to high. Mm -hmm. So the strings are kind of on the plane that they're going to be on. Yes, if her racket is half a degree off, that accounts for the three, four feet. Mm -hmm. But if she rolls it just a touch, or if she hits it one square off the sweet spot, well, then it loses mile per hour and it goes shorter. Mm -hmm. Right? So that that is my, actually, no one's ever asked me that. But on the spot, that's what I would think is that since it's a lifting game, yeah. Your strings are generally facing the target, but you know if you hit it a little faster or if you hit it two feet higher on accident, well, that's going to go much deeper. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you can see pros will hit balls on the, they hit balls on the service line all the time. I know people want to think <laughs> yeah. they never do, but they also miss deep. Yeah. So from the service line to the baseline is 18 feet. So if you watch someone and they hit one ball on the service line at that point, and then the next ball, they miss three feet deep. You're like, wow, that was a 21 foot difference between those two shots. 
Mm-hmm. I guarantee you where they weren't aiming at either of those two targets. They were probably aiming yeah. three quarter court. Somewhere in the middle. Times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So like the swing path is a lot steeper at the higher levels. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lifting okay. game and the strings are on target longer, but again, I, even for, if I do this drill with a three Oh and I'll, I'll put a ball down and I'll take a video so I can just show them where their balls landed. It's still mm-hmm. an oval. It's still yeah. always deeper than it is what. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what is number five? Uh, ground strokes in the net. So again, it's the first obstacle in tennis. If you really want to never miss the net, you can. You just aim higher. Like it's mm-hmm. it's not more complicated than that. Now in doubles, why don't people aim higher? I actually don't know because most people don't like their overheads. It's a little bit awkward. If there's a good opponent who gets very tight to the net, sometimes that high ball is a little weird. And again, it's the same idea. Even if I aim high, let's say I'm aiming five feet over the net in doubles. Okay. Will I ever accidentally hit lower than I aimed? Yes. So I'm still going to hit just as many of those nice low ground strokes that are tough for people to poach on. It's just going to be an accident. If I hit that ball perfectly, it might be a high volley for them. It might. It also might not. And if I accidentally hit it a little higher than I intended, now it's actually a really good lob on accident. Mm -hmm. But no free points are being given. And I'm going to accidentally hit plenty of really, really effective shots. And even the one that might not be, people still miss volleys all the time. So Mm -hmm. again, net and wide airs to me are primarily mental. Mm -hmm. I think if you aim and just play with discipline, even if your strokes are not amazing, you can probably really, really reduce those two. Missing deep is different for me. And it's not one of my Stokie six. Because you have to have a closed racket face and get topspin on the ball at a certain point. And you're going to have to miss somewhere. So, like, I can't just tell you to not miss. But missing net for me, I just, again, it's not quite as bad as missing wide, but it's close. They have a battle. Yeah. Yeah. Missing deep, I I feel like is, usually if I miss deep, it's like a good miss, right? Like, I missed a lob a foot or two long, or I hit a topspin forehand that I, I made good contact. I hit it well. It's just like, you know, eight or 12 inches long. That's a good miss. Yeah. Um, one thing with missing in the net, I guess with doubles that's different is the the formation or the positions of the opponents, right? So we can have one up, one back, we can have two back and we can have two up. Um, even at the pro level, I, I do see players missing in the net with two players back. And that that's when I would talk about pulling your hair out. Like that's when I want to pull my hair out. I'm like, both players are back how on earth could you miss the net? Like, why are you trying to keep the ball low? Um, But with both up, I think the important thing is noticing the position of the two opponents, which player tends to close a little bit harder. And then you can use that lob like you're talking about. Uh, And then something else that came to mind for me is this was back in, I think, 2019. So I was um, a four or five at the time. And our team uh, in Austin, went ended up going to nationals and I played doubles a few times with this guy from Germany who was a uh, he played like club tennis in Germany really high level he he definitely should not have been a 4 or 5 it was we got a lot of complaints about it um but he hit these like really high topspin ground strokes and when I would play doubles with him our you know we'd inevitably face some teams who would like serve and volley or both get to the net and I was always about like dipping my forehand low at their feet. And he just kept his ground strokes the exact same. They were like six to eight feet over the net, really heavy. Um, They would land with a lot of depth if the ball got back to the baseline. And he didn't change them at all when the opponents got to the net. And it was crazy to me how much our opponents struggled with this ball. Like these were high volleys that, in my mind, were supposed to be easy, but because he had good spin on him, decent pace, and a lot of time he would put it on the backhand side of the opponent, like they would end up just shanking it short and we'd have an easy put away or they'd miss. Um, It it was really crazy to me. So I think for club players, sometimes those higher volleys, especially the high backhand volley, are really, really difficult, even more difficult than those ones you hit low over the net. And I understand the idea of, hey, there's two people up, so we want to dip it low at their feet. There's, I absolutely understand that. And if Mm -hmm. you can execute that, that's an awesome play. I'm all for that. If you can make one and then miss one, you're not good enough to do that. 
you have right. to accept that and go, damn, hitting low would be the right play. I just don't have the ground strokes to do that. So I've got to aim with a little more height and just be simple and use my legs and track down one volley and they'll probably miss the second one, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a, then I hear some people say, well, I have to try that shot because I'd have to learn how to hit it if I want to level up. Like I have to learn how to dip it at their feet. And I'm like, yeah, you know, when you practice that on the ball machine or in your lesson and it takes thousands and thousands of reps, if you just try yeah. it five times in your 4-0 league match every other weekend, yeah. you're never going to learn how to hit a dipper. That's yeah. just not how it works. It's almost disrespectful to people who have learned the shot. Like it took me thousands and tens of thousands and watching video of reps to get really good doubles volleys. Mm -hmm. It didn't take one virtual lesson and I went on the ball machine one day and now I know how to do it. And yeah. so uh, with all these things, we're talking about reducing errors. Like, yes, you do need to learn how to hit quality shots, but the time to work on that is not just solely in match play. That's yeah, when you 100%. Want to yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, one of the, one of the drills that I uh, I haven't been playing recently, but last summer I was playing a lot more, and I was uh, out there with one of my friends who coaches, and we would feed to each other. And one of the drills I would I would do was he he would just feed me balls in the ad court because I returned from the ad court, and I would hit run around forehands, and I worked on those specific shots. I set up a target on the singles line, probably four or five feet past the net. And I would try to just roll it and dip it at that ad court player's backhand volley. I would also set one up four or five feet behind the net, um, right on the center service line, so right through the middle. Uh, and then I would set up a target deep just inside the singles line. So just to push the ad court player back. Um, and depending on the ball he fed me, I would just choose a target and mix it up. Um, but I would hit, I don't know, and he'd feed for, to me for like 10 minutes and I'd hit 100 200 balls in like 10 minutes or something i, I don't know the how many exactly but um over the course of like a month or two like those shots got a lot better um but Absolutely. yeah you have you have to put in the work um 100 percent. so let's uh do number six all right so in my single soaky six this would be a change of direction there so in singles i hate i mean just go cross court 90 but if you want to cross court 100 percent of the time in singles you're probably making the optimal decision 85 percent of the time yeah which i guarantee is higher than the decision making you're currently making so if you just blanket yeah. statements that i will only go cross court and that's why that one kills me so the all-time worst stokey six error is you miss a plus one wide while changing directions that's a three-pointer that is like go sit down on the bench and think about what you've done type of thing the mm -hmm. reason why I don't have that in doubles is because number one, the court is nine feet wider and you are going to have to go down the line. Mm -hmm. some. I mean, if you play me and you never go down the line, I'm going to poach on you every time. Mm -hmm. So there is some implied risk that you will eventually have to take. So that is not this. The number six for doubles I put is volleying wide. Mm -hmm. So again, if I'm closing the net and I'm a menace up there and I can play with some speed and pace, I can go at my opponent net player's feet. I can stick it deep and then get my overhead, but I don't have to always go around these two players. I know there's an extra person covering the court, but I feel like that is the gut reaction. I see a lot of people make is angle right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, people don't get close to the net, which makes the angle volley even more difficult. Right. So this one's tricky because like I said, when you're at the net and you're playing offense, I am okay with the occasional air. I actually think most volleys that you miss should probably be in the net. Because you are trying to keep a ball lower, right? You can't hit a volley with great height. So yeah. I'm like, you know what? If you hit the top of the tape here and there, I, I understand it. You're trying to hit hard. Missing wide, I don't really, I, I just don't get that one. And so if you're going to be at the net, you're going to be taking balls, go at their feet, go through them, go middle with pace. Number one, they're probably going to miss that coming back to you, or they'll give you an even easier ball, which you can then either put away with an overhead or a volley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like I should do an episode on like the different types of volleys. Um, I talked with, I think it was with Peter recently about all the different types of volleys or maybe it was someone else. But um, yeah, I, I think some of these offensive volleys missing in the net is understandable, like you said. Um, the one I have issue with is the transition volley. Like when I see transition volleys missed in the net, when somebody's like hitting a volley from the service line or from just inside the service line and they're moving forward i'm like this is not the ball to end the point on right like this is a transition ball i want you placing it deep 
to the baseline player and then getting to the net. And then on the next one, if you miss in the net, I'm okay with that. Um, but I feel like so many players miss that transition volley in the net because they're trying to keep it low. And I, I just don't think that's necessary. Um, and then with the angles and missing wide, a lot of that it goes back to the drill I was talking about earlier is like in practice, miss as many wide as you can and go for that sharper and sharper angle. And then that'll make it so much more comfortable when you're in a match. You don't have to go that sharp. And then it's going to be much easier. You can aim for that, you know, inside that singles line and still hit that angle. And you'll miss a few wide of the singles line, which will still be in. And you'll miss a few long of the singles line or short of your target. Uh, and all those still land in because you've kind of refined those skills a bit. So if if people out there, if it, let's say they, they use like swing vision or something and they've got matches, if they go back and they go, okay, I'm going to chart how many Stokey sixes I have. Okay. So I missed a return. Okay, that's one. I double faulted two. I missed a plus one wide. Okay, damn, that's three. You know, like, oh, that's yeah. not great. And you keep tracking. You go, okay, my score for that match was 50. Okay. And then you go and you find a match where you won. And you felt like you played great. And you go, oh, I only had 35 or 30. And you start going and you, you chart this every time. And you go, okay, I went from 50 on average. Now I'm only making 20 of those errors combined. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you are playing better. Yeah, I guarantee it. Like, it's not the goal is not to get to zero. Some people, I don't have a problem with this. I know most people do. Like the idea of like, oh, I want to get rid of missing. Oh, it's so scary. That's so tentative. Oh, I'm not going to accelerate anymore. That's not what I'm saying. And you're going to miss no matter what. That is the game we play. Like, I think even if you have the day of your life, you're going to miss one out of every four points. Yeah. That's just reality. I'm just seeing if we can get these errors. If you make 30 a match, let's get it down to 20. And then let's mm -hmm. see if we can get down to 18. And then we'll see if we can get down to 17. And every point counts, you know? And if you mm -hmm. go, I can get rid of one of these in a match. Congratulations. That's awesome. So it's not panic because you double faulted and missed a return. And oh my God, I, how can I make this mistake? Mm -hmm. That's not the mindset. It's just reducing these. And once you actually start to have metrics to show you that you have, you're going to probably be like, oh yeah, I'm winning matches. I didn't really feel like I hit the ball that well. That is the goal. If you can mm -hmm. only win a match when you're hitting the ball incredibly well, your tactic might be suboptimal. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I feel like if you just charted like the return errors and the plus one errors, like that alone would probably bring, if you're a 4-0, that would probably bring you up to a 4-5 if you can improve that by 20%. Like, You know, what's I actually, qu question for you, you're back on my podcast, but I agree with you. If you just learn how to make those balls, everyone thinks the difference between a four or five and a five O is speed of shot. Oh, they can do all these things. They can hit all these shots better. And my take on it, just from my experience, again, is I'm watching. I'm like, oh, no, no, they just missed that ball 2% less than you. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the better hitter is. I watched the four hit with a four or five. I don't know yeah. who the better player is. It's yeah. just you make less errors. Yeah, I think... Um... I don't know. Something came to mind when you were going through these is that, uh, that I guess there, there's a reason everybody hates playing pushers and there's a reason that pushers win is because they don't make these errors. Um, so when you're, you're talking about the difference between like four Oh and four five, some people will ask me like three, five to four Oh, whatever. I think it's all like very player specific, right? Like some people, like for me, so I'm a 5-0 now. Like what's the difference between me and a 5-5? Like I've probably maxed out my strategy. Like I like I go through doubles matches. I mean, if I went out and played right now because I hadn't been playing recently, I'd probably make some uh, strategic errors because I haven't been playing a lot. But when I'm playing a lot of tennis, like I'll go through a whole match and, and after every point I'm doing this, like I'm like, okay, did I make any strategic mistakes there? Like I'm always making technical mistakes. But like, did I make a shot selection error or did I move to the wrong spot? And I'll go through a whole match and maybe like two or three times, I'm like, ah, I probably should have done that. And I should have known that with the information I had at the time. Um, so for me, it's like technical. It's like, I got to get out on the practice court and I got to improve my forehand. I got to improve my serve. I got to hit a hundred returns. Like that's the difference between me and a five, five right now. So Whereas, I want to be, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, I just so, wanted, no, you you go ahead. So, so I, I just all I'm saying is I think it's de dependent on the person, um, and for that, like for me, it's basically just the consistency of the shot. Whereas 
I will play um, against other 5-0 players who would wipe me off the court in singles. But I am so much smarter than them on the doubles court that I can beat them on the doubles court. And like they have a much more consistent topspin forehand than me. They have a better serve than me. They have a better return than me. But I know how to move at the net better. And I'm making the right shot selection the majority of the time. And they're not. I'm forcing them down the line. So for that player, uh, they have to work on their like strategic and tactical mindset and, and shot selection. Right. And just to be crystal clear, what you were saying, yes, they're like a 4-5 hits the ball better than a 3-5. A 5-5 five, five hits it better than a 4-5. But when you said the technical element, and you actually added it after I interrupted you four times, like it's the consistency. It's learning to get my technique so I can be more consistent. It's not like, hey, Stokey, I got to get my technique better so I can add 10 miles an hour to my forehand. That, yeah, is not, that is not the adjustment you're making. It's like, hey, I can actually hit it as fast as this 4-5. Mm -hmm. I just miss it after my third ball. They miss it after their fifth. So, yeah. can, we, so can we improve my stroke? So I can now make it five times, not, you know, I have people coming up, I got to, I got to add like a thousand RPMs to my forehand. <laughs> and, and what I always say, I actually did this, like my favorite guy that I coach remotely, he was in town one time and I said, okay, here's the rule. I'll just hit slower than you on every shot that you hit to me. So you hit a ball to me. I have to hit it back slower. What do you think the score is going to be? Well, it's going to be O and O and I'll probably never lose a point is what I said, which is like super arrogant, but whatever. But my mindset was like, Hey, I'm going to prove to you that it's not about the quality of the ball. The difference is, is you know, that I'm literally never going to miss. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to beat me? Yeah. It's going to be impossible. Right? So my technique is good enough at that four or five level to hit slow and never miss. Mm -hmm. That's why my strokes will add up, but no one would watch me and go, wow, he hits so fast. Wow. He hits so deep. They just go, mm -hmm. the guy, the guy's technique is good enough where he will never miss. Now that would end up breaking down if I was playing pros. Yeah. Now, now I do need to get my strokes better. So you said it right. It's working on that consistency with your stroke. Yeah. I think it, to borrow another phrase from Craig, uh, he says how you hit the ball matters and where you hit it matters more. And I think that's just a hundred percent true. So like if you are a, a 4-0 player um the the best way I, I think to measure this is like figure out what shots you do need to work on and then set up those targets hit 100 of them how many times do you hit the target out of 100 that's your baseline number and like in a month from now if you hit 50 out of 100 in a month from now if you are hitting 65 out of 100 then you've just improved like that's it it's that simple so it's like whether it's serve targets return targets, forehand, volley, whatever it is. Um, if you can set up those targets, and these need to be probably big targets generally, right? So we're aiming maybe for the back box um, to the ad court, and we just want to aim for that square, like that half of the the no man's land rectangle. Um, well, well, what's one of the most important things with tennis, right, is having confidence. And if you have true confidence, it's because you have a mountain of evidence that supports you are who you think you are. So right. I have been in the middle of the court playing doubles for 25 years. Yeah, I know this works for me. It's worked yeah. a million. It's just worked all the time. So mm -hmm. I know this is what I need to be doing. And I've made hundreds of thousands of volleys in practice and matches. So I feel comfortable on a match point sticking my nose out there. Now, mm -hmm. if you don't have that mountain of evidence and you don't put yourself in these positions, then you're not going to have confidence to do these things. Right. Mm -hmm. So like you just said, if you can go out and hit that target 65 times, I have some evidence now that I have the shot instead of just going, I think I just kind of want to try it at 40 all. Yeah. Like, of course, you're going to have some tension. Of course, you're going to miss that ball. Yeah. So we could go on and on, I know. Um, but let's hop off here. Any final uh, thoughts or requests of the audience or, or tips you want to leave people with? Video your matches chart things. It's objective data. Go watch yourself, chart the Stokey six. And again, just the baseline idea that points are lost, not won. And if mm -hmm. I can just learn how to stop losing so many, I can just lose a little bit less. That is where I make my first big jump. And then once you say like you, when you've maxed out on your tactics and whatever, now let's go get our shots a little better and we can squeeze another point or two out of my game. But that's where I would go. Video your stuff, Stokey six, Points are lost, not won. Mm -hmm. 100%. So uh, for people who want to follow you, you're on Instagram, Stokey Tennis. Is that right? 
Stokey Tennis, my last name, Tennis, no, no space, super original name. I've got the same name on YouTube. I just started doing that. I actually really enjoy the YouTube too, because I can do like a six minute lesson instead of like a 25 second 20 sprint seconds. to get yeah. your attention. Yeah. Um, I got a newsletter uh, based on intelligence. It's on Substack. Uh, and then obviously my podcast based on intelligence. Cool. All right, everybody check all that out. I'll link to it all in the show notes as well. And thank you all for listening.